All right, guys. It is another dark and stormy night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. Uh, that would be a Monday night, November 28th, 2022. So uh, <laughs> I'm trying out a new uh, video format. I'm sending this out to my good friend uh, Andy the Gardener. So Andy, what do you think of the new set change here at Collapse Chronicles? I, I know Andy uh, will understand the, uh, will, will get the joke more than anybody else on the planet. I will say that Andy the Gardener uh, understands, uh, understands me better than anyone I have ever met. Anywho's, but I'm also, I want to send out a big thank you to my other good buddy, Brother Roy. Brother Roy for sending me this uh, this fine piece of writing from Counterpunch. Now I know I just did a a rant from this fellow, one of the main editors at Counterpunch, uh, Jeffrey St. Clair. I know I've done a reading from him recently, but this one, uh, Roy, I think is an excellent uh, spotter of good journalism and I just want whenever uh, a, a an example of excellent what I consider to be excellent writing comes across my radar I just want to share it with you now this is fairly long so I hope you enjoy what was I called in that review that I read last night my soothing garrulous? Am I soothing and garrulous? Because this could take a while. Uh, you can go on. I'll put the link and if you don't want to listen to my soothing garrulous voice, you can go read it yourself from Counterpunch. And I guess this is a this is a uh, selection, a small selection from Jeffrey's new book called An Orgy of Thieves which I think that he co-wrote uh, with uh, Alexander Cockburn. I don't see Alexander's, uh, I don't see his byline on here, so I'm assuming this is all Jeffrey, and uh, you can decide for yourself what this has to do with a collapse of a planet, and uh, Andy the Gardener, uh, Dollar General, is one of these uh, <laughs> it is it is one of these little slices of Americana that if Andy the gardener lived in uh, America, you better believe that I uh, he would know exactly what uh, <laughs> what Jeffrey St. Clair is talking about here. So you can decide whether this is an article about Dollar General or the collapse of at least the American Empire. Take it away, Jeffrey St. Clair from an orgy of thieves. The retail carrion feeders of rural America. For the last month and a half, I've driven the back roads of southern Indiana, crisscrossing the unglaciated hill country 40 miles south of Indianapolis and 40 miles north of Louisville. It's mostly forested here, large, remarkably unbroken stretches of deciduous woodlands, thick with red oak and shag bark hickory, tulip poplar and black walnut, white ash and wild cherry, American beech and sugar maple. The soil is largely red clay, not productive for farming or septic systems, but quite satisfactory for morel mushrooms, homegrown weed, and copperheads. The towns are small, little more than villages, clustered near the railroads in old blue highways. I spent my summers here for 20 years and lived here for a decade. We raised both of our kids here, and since moving to Oregon in 1990, we've come back every year or so. 
for most of that time, nothing much about the landscape, the people, or the towns changed. They were much as they were in 1982 or 1972. To the north, the suburbs of Indianapolis gnawed up more and more farmland and woodlots, including the 40-acre farm of my mother's family, which dated back to the 1820s. The fields are now covered by a super drugstore, a Kroger, a Chick, a Kroger, and is a supermarket, kind of like Tesco over there, I believe, a Chick fil A, a furniture, st furniture store, and a church with a vast parking lot where carloads come in search for salvation. The place is Jesus mad though few could tell you more than a couple of garbled lines of his teachings, I can't bear to go back without wanting to blow something up. For years, the hill country seemed immune to this kind of cultural entropy billed as progress, but in the last five years, the economic decay has accelerated. Familiar stores are boarded up. Houses have been abandoned. Cars left to rust in fields and yards where they stopped running months ago. Handmade for sale signs are tacked to telephone poles. It's a yard sale economy. Even churches here have padlocks on their doors, especially the denominational churches of my youth, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, and Catholic, replaced by evangelical and four-square churches in trailers, barns, and prefab buildings. Their devotional services announced on yard signs like advertisements for the second coming. The old family-owned grocery store, which served people in a 20-mile radius for 50 years, is gone, replaced by a Dollar General store whose aisles have not been washed in weeks where the air smells of body odor and spilled dairy products. I took it as a sign when Dollar General shows up in your town, it's like a death notice for your community. And don't expect it to offer you a chance to win your life in a game of chess or quick mark kino. These stores are replicating across rural America. There are now more dollar stores 50,000 of them by one count, then there are McDonald's and Walmarts combined. They rang up $34 billion in sales during the first year of the pandemic, selling crap for a dollar more or less. Well, Jeffrey St. Clair is showing with that comment that he's never been to a dollar store. You can't find anything at the do at Dollar General for a dollar anymore. Even at the Dollar Tree is a dollar twenty-five now. Um, he is right about all of these places smelling the same. I have three dollar stores uh, within twenty minutes of me at Bugs in a Jar Farm, which I told. Uh, which I told Roy is a good trick since I live 21 minutes from anywhere. I've got three of these things. I visit my local dollar store in Candor, New York, probably two or three times a week when I'm too lazy to drive to the 23 miles to Ithaca to go to Walmart. Anyway, uh, back to uh, back to. Jeffrey um, talking incorrectly, well, correctly about selling crap, but it's for a hell of a lot more than a dollar. Uh, anyway, as 
they drive out the local groceries, fresh food is replaced with the kind of high calorie, sugar rich processed junk that is fueling the health crisis in low income America. The owner of an IGA, an IGA is a, uh, it's a small grocery store serving in, in rural America, like medium-sized towns. Their IGA is not a supermarket. They're, they're bigger than a uh, 7-Eleven, but smaller than a supermarket. They're serving the niche of, I, I, I don't know, a little bit bigger than villages. The owner of an IGA in a town 10 miles to the north where a Dollar General store sprouted up told me that his store lost 35% of its sales the first year after Dollar General moved in and the sales have kept declining each year since. We can't keep up, he told me. We're hanging on by our fingernails and not long for this world. The average hourly wage for Dollar General workers, sales associates they call them, is $9 an hour. An assistant store manager makes on average $11 an hour. That's hardly enough to shop for essentials at Dollar General if you can find any essentials on those forbidding shelves. Well, Jeffrey, I find all kinds of essentials on those forbidding shelves. You could, uh, last time I was in Dollar General, about her, I was thinking, you know, if, if it really came to it, you could live, you could survive living in a Dollar General. It, it has, that's what it sells is the essentials. All right. The rot is metastasizing. Dollar General and Dollar Tree, now the Dollar 25 tree, want to add another 30,000 stores in the next few years. Their corporate executives are attuned to the scent of decay. They are retail carrion feeders. Their stores are as austere and bland as any state-run outlet in Kosaku's Bucharest. Step inside one, and you could not tell whether you were standing in Bean Blossom, Indiana, Hinton, West Virginia, or Candor, New York. There have been three suicides in this sparsely populated county in the past two weeks, all of them men younger than 30. One was an acquaintance who shot himself in his mother's house while his younger brother slept in the adjacent room. No one saw it coming. Some hoped it had been an accident that he had been cleaning his gun when it went off. Those hopes slim as they were, were dashed when they found his note. But there was no why. Yet deep down, everybody seemed to know that he had looked into the future and saw none. He had come to believe that his life was a failure, that he was a burden on those he loved, a burden they were struggling to afford, a burden that weighed on his conscience, a burden he just could not think about anymore and had to silence with a bullet to the head. But it was this increasingly perverse society that failed him, failed his family, failed his dying community, a society that failed to listen, that failed to care, that failed to act, until his funeral when the trustees donated some money for his funeral and burial. 
I didn't know this young man well, but I knew the contours of his life. He was bright, honest, good with his hands. He could fix a broken engine or rewire an exterior outlet. He could hang drywall and shoe a horse. He could lay a septic system and trim trees. These are valuable skills in a functional economy, but this is not a functional economy. It doesn't function for people anyway. It grinds them down and does not look back. He should have been able to make it. Life should not have been as hard as it was for him, but opportunities kept shutting down. Options for escape kept closing. Abandoned by his father, protective of his mother and brother, he was stuck as the community around him, the few stable anchors in his life, began to crumble. There was nowhere to go, nowhere left to turn. Of course, I am not attributing his death to the coming of Dollar General directly, but to an economic model that favors in nearly every aspect of our lives that kind of predation on the vulnerable and the marginalized. Just down the block from the funeral home, there is a big sign advertising jobs in the county. The local high school cannot find a head custodian. Little wonder the starting salary pays $13.50 an hour. I pay $20 an hour here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. My cash on the barrel head and free room and board, by the way. <clears throat> Just saying. The McDonald's in another nearby town, a regional tourist spot, put up a sign announcing they were closing at 8 p.m. on Friday and Saturday nights because they were short of staff. They were, they too are advertising jobs at less than $14 an hour for dull, thankless work. Corporate America thinks rural America has no choice but to take these jobs at shit pay. The unions have been beaten down. The politicians blame extended unemployment benefits. The churches are obsessed with gun rights and the tyranny of COVID masks. Well, I'm glad to see at least the rural churches are uh, obsessed with something they need to be obsessed about, which is the tyranny of COVID masks. But that's uh, another rant for another day. <clears throat> Still, people are starting to refuse the slops that are offered them. The COVID lockdowns, hated here in the hollows and hills as intensely as anywhere, have taught people there are other ways to get by, modes of life that don't require you to submit to the least that's offered, to work crap jobs for crap wages in dangerous conditions with no health care. It may be a silent resistance, but it's building. And uh, Andy the Gardener, you will be thrilled to see that uh, Jeffrey St. Clair just committed a, a grammar crime. The word it's IT, uh, he has it ITS building, but it's building. Uh, you know, it, it's hell being a copy editor, you know, going on here and, and finding that the editor of Counterpunch does not know the difference between ITS and IT apostrophe S. It's not that damn hard.
okay? It's, even though it's the possessive, it does, you drop the apostrophe even though it is the possessive form. When it is a contraction, contracting the two words it is, it, you spell it I-T apostrophe S. It's building means the resistance has a building and it's the building, the, the physical building belonging to the resistance is what this says. Okay, I need to let Jeffrey St. Clair know that he needs a damn someone to tidy up his grammar uh, so he doesn't sound like a fool. Anyway, moving on. People don't trust their bosses, their banks, or their government. They don't trust that the insurance they pay out, the ass, they don't trust that the insurance they pay out the ass for will really cover them if they have a stroke or get cancer or contract corona panic on the job. Yet, the people most in need of national health care are among the least likely to support it. If you don't trust the government, if it's never done much of anything for you except demean your existence, humiliate you for asking for help, and make your life harder than it is already, why would you want them tending to your failing body? <clears throat> the fear isn't irrational, it's been learned over generations. The Dollar General theory is as cruel as it is simple. At least he, uh, he did not use the contractual form as it is. He spelled out the two words. Thank you, Jeffrey. The Dollar General theory is as cruel as it is simple. They want you to work cheap, live cheap, and die cheap. They don't want to pay you what you're worth or pay you or pay for you when you're ill, even if they cause your sickness. Where are you going to go? Who are you going to turn to? The town you have known all your life is boarded up. The grocery store and hardware store are gone. The coffee shop is closed. The gas stations the gas stations no longer have mechanics. Most don't even have attendants. Just insert a card and go. You need a credit card for everything now, even if your credit is in the toilet. It's not just the supply chains that are broken. The threads that have bound these small communities together since the Great Depression are fraying. No one knows their banker anymore. Uh, well, I actually know my banker in town. Uh, anyway, no one knows their banker anymore. Many of the local banks have been replaced by ATM machines, racking up hidden fees for every impersonal service rendered. There has not been a town doctor here in five years. People have to drive 20 miles west to Bloomington or 30 miles east to Columbus and then, they're, and then they are often treated by a nurse or a physician's assistant for the diseases that are ravaging these small towns. Diabetes, congestive heart failure, emphysema, opioid addiction, the diseases of the passed over and forgotten, the diseases that don't pay. For some reason, I was struck by the recent proliferation of 
missing in action flags. I have to admit, uh, so am I. I know exactly what this dude is talking about. For some reason, I was struck by the recent proliferation of missing in action flags, which I had rarely, <coughs> if ever, noticed down here before. There are now more of them than Trump flags, of which there are still many. These black flags fly from houses and schools, post offices and fire stations, city parks, and some of the few remaining local businesses. It's been nearly 50 years since the fall of Saigon and the end of that savage war seems more immediate than ever. I asked a few people if they knew any MIAs. No one could name a single one. No surprise, there were hardly any. Few people even knew anyone that served in Vietnam. It seemed clear that what had really gone missing was an idea of America itself, a void in the national identity that remains dark and inexplicable and as the scenes of planes ferrying desperate people out of Afghanistan played endlessly on cable TV, it is a hole that continues to grow. Oh, it's a hole. I do not believe it. IT apostrophe S. You go. All right. The correct usage of the word it's. It's a hole that continues to grow, consuming what we thought we knew about ourselves. A couple of, a couple of nights ago, I met up with some old friends in a bar we used to frequent near Lake Lemon. It's seen, all right, IT apostrophe S. Now that is the, that is it has seen. IT apostrophe S. It's contracting the two words it has. So you put the apostrophe whether it's it is or it has. Okay. It's seen better days and is now kept afloat largely by the throngs of bikers who pass through on most weekends. As a group, we did not have much in common except our youth. Those differences in background and education never stood in the way before, but tonight the room crackled with tension. You could feel it in the air. It was palpable. I grew up with many of these people, played baseball with them, got lost in the woods looking for chanterelles with them. Chantrells, my ass. They were looking for magic mushrooms. Yeah, chantrells, please. <clears throat> Fished for smallmouth bass with them. Got drunk on the porch with them. Now every conversation seemed hard, strained, freighted with suspicion and latent anger. Everyone seemed wary of each other. The camaraderie of youth had been broken like so much else. The mood was sour as the beer. I rarely talk about politics, I'm sure, Jeffrey. I rarely talk about politics. I usually find it the most boring topic on earth aside from NFL football, but now Everything seems intensely political, which is perhaps as it must be. Each phrase, no matter how inconsequential, was spoken with caution, as if the wrong inflection might set off some chain reaction. All patience has been lost. People are tired of waiting. The waiting for what no one would or perhaps even could say. Yet, we all agreed 
and then almost immediately questioned our agreement. Politics has failed, but what comes next? Something's gotta give. Something's gotta break wide open. There you go. So this essay is excerpted from An Orgy of Thieves, Neoliberalism and Its Discontents by Alexander Cockburn and Jeffrey St. Clair, available only from Counterpunch Books. Jeffrey St. Clair is editor of Counterpunch. His most recent books are Bernie and the Sandernistas, Field Notes from a Failed Revolution, and The Big Heat, Earth on the Brink, co-authored with Joshua Frank. Anyway, amen, brother. Uh, Jeffrey St. Clair. Uh, you know, I have just enough of the lefty left in me to appreciate some good lefty writing every now and then. But anyway, uh, I got to get this heater back on. I think it's snowing outside. Get back to my little seven foot by seven foot prison cell. And think what I need to run get at Dollar General tomorrow. Pretty sure I need to go get a gallon of milk and some other essentials at Dollar General tomorrow. I'm glad Jeffrey reminded me. Get out there and get your essentials from Dollar General while you still can because one day you're going to go to Dollar General and there ain't going to be nothing essential on those empty shelves. Bye guys. Well.